talk about today is um, some recent work by my PhD student who was also a member of the program. So it's nice for me to be able to come back and, and tell you about uh, the findings of her work, but we'll get to that shortly. Um, just to lay out quickly what, what we'll talk about today, I'll only spend a few minutes talking about the language profile that, that we find in Alzheimer's disease. I'd like to um, then move on to uh, very quickly to talking about how we can communicate uh, or, or maximize and facilitate uh, successful communication with uh, individuals with Alzheimer's. And uh, we'll talk about some different um, strategies and approaches uh, when I talk about what I'm calling here loosely verbal strategies, that's really uh, talking about our recent research, specifically uh, all of the work that Roseanne Wilson did. And then we'll talk uh, about some recent findings um, in, in the literature in other domains that have an impact on uh, communication. Hopefully that's what you came to hear. <laughs> so, you know, you never know. Um, so. Um, I put this slide here for, uh, to remind myself and, and, and to remind you or point out to you that uh, what we're going to be talking about today in terms of patterns of reserve, uh, preserved abilities and, and impaired abilities is not an all or none thing, okay? So you don't get Alzheimer's disease one day and become completely unable to talk or remember or, or anything. It's a, it's a staged thing. And in general, we um, three stages are recognized. Um, stage one, two, or three, or mild, moderate, and severe. And the amount of, of time that a person might remain in a given stage um, is variable uh, depending on, on the individual, okay? Uh, there's my arrow again to remind me to say once again what I just said, which is that um, this is not an all or none thing. The difficulties that people experience with uh, speaking and language and communication can start out pretty, to be pretty minimal, to be pretty circumscribed, to be pretty mild, but eventually they do progress uh, with the stages of the disease. So in the early stages, we might find that the most prominent problem that a person or their family reports is anomia, or a difficulty in, in finding the right words that they're trying to say. They might have reduced comprehension, but usually pretty mild, not, not a really significant problem. Um, but in conversations, um, you might find what we call discourse, uh, you might find that words are kind of getting vaguer. They're not coming up with the exact word that they're looking for, so they might be using more pronouns, uh, the and this, or more vague terms like that thing, for instance, as opposed to, you know, the table or the chair. Um, impaired word fluency just refers to one of the commonly used tests, so coming up again with words quickly is difficult. And because people are having trouble with words, they circumlocute or they talk around the word that they, they're trying to find. Instead of saying, you know, steak, they say that thing that we like to eat, you know, whether we have mushrooms with or whatever, but they can't quite find the word. Uh, and then sometimes you notice even early on what we call formulaic language. So those are the sort of stereotyped um, phrases that we all use. Sometimes they're idiosyncratic to ourselves or sometimes they're the, the kind of social greeting things, you know, how you doing today um, or whatever uh, it might be for a given individual. As we progress through the different um, stages, this again, difficulty following commands refers to a test. We don't usually go through life following commands when we're adults, but the idea is that when you have to do one thing after the other and remember a sequence of events, that's going to start to pose problems for you. Um, when you're looking for those words that you can't find now, you might be um, uh, replacing the word that you can't find with what's called a semantic paraphasia, meaning a word that's related in meaning. So instead of saying my son, you might say my daughter. Uh, you might be wanting to say tiger, but instead lion comes out, and so on. And so that's a semantic paraphasia because it's related in meaning to the word that you're looking for. There might be um, irrelevant or tangential talk. You start a conversation, you think you're talking about one topic, and all of a sudden you realize a few sentences later 
the person's gone off topic and you're not exactly sure how that happened and, and where that topic came in. Um, uh, difficulties maintaining the topic, so that's related to what I said, and difficulty in making inferences. So that might seem unusual, but in um, the study of discourse, which I won't get into today, theoretically speaking, what we know is to actually follow a conversation, but also in reading, and this is a, a, one of the reasons people also have trouble um, uh, with reading and reading comprehension in addition to memory problems, um, what we do in a conversation is we're constantly making inferences because not everything I say to you as I'm speaking to you, not everything I say do I say explicitly. The, one, the second sentence that follows a first one that I might have said contains information that expects you to kind of make a little bit of a, a leap with me so that you know where we're going in this conversation. And we do that all the time even though we're not aware of it. But this becomes very difficult and might be one of the, the, the reasons for people having difficulty staying on topic, uh, understanding and so on. And then in the later stages, um, uh, understanding and producing language uh, becomes very difficult. Uh, people produce what are called neologisms. So instead of those semantic paraphrases that I referred to where people were previously substituting words that might have been related in meaning to the words that they were trying to say, now they're saying words that are kind of nonsense, non-words we call them. They're sort of, they sound like gibberish to you. You can't really figure out what that, that unintelligible bit of, of, of production is. Um, in the very late stages, we see echolalia, which is that they repeat what is said to them, or what's called palilalia, which is where they just um, repeat the same thing over again, so essentially their own words. And in the very end stages, there people become mute, essentially, um, assuming they live that long, and um, they, however, are aware of your uh, emotions, so facial gestures, uh, facial expressions, and uh, simple gestures. So if we're going to kind of try to summarize all of that, what we see is a progressive across that continuum difficulty in producing the right words, eventually in understanding words, then sentences, and uh, stories, conversations, discourse, difficulty responding to questions, following directions, and ultimately participating in conversations. Um, now this decline results in problems, of course, for the person who's having those difficulties, often leads to a lot of frustration, and certainly difficulties interacting with others, and especially in the later stages, um, but it depends in some people, it can be earlier, there are often um, behavioral outbursts which can really uh, challenge the skills and the creativity not only of the person themselves who's trying to cope with these uh, behaviors but also of the resources of the caregiver whether that caregiver is a family member or um, what we call formal caregivers so professionals who might be working in an institutionalized setting um, if, if that's where a person uh, is residing. And we know now uh, there's a large body of evidence that um, that it probably even more than pharmacological intervention, um, what we call behavioral intervention. So the way that we um, interact and respond to these sometimes difficult behaviors are actually uh, more effective at hello at um, at helping the person to get over that and to overcome them. So, so this topic, I think, of today, not just because I'm interested in it and it's my area of expertise, but <laughs> this, this topic becomes really important in light of, of, of what I've just said about managing uh, difficult behaviors. Um, so this is going to lead into the work that I alluded to of Roseanne Wilson, who was a PhD student in my lab and graduated I think it was last year, but it might have been the year before. I'm kind of losing track. <laughs> and, um, who was, uh, as I said, a, a member of, of this program and who benefited immensely from her uh, membership in the collaborative program. And so Roseanne um, uh, became, was very interested in the cognitive and the, the linguistic difficulties 
that patients with Alzheimer's disease had and how the constellation of these difficulties, whether they were linguistic or, the, or, or visual spatial or memory or whether it was difficulty with motor, how all of that together um, made uh, for difficulty in carrying out activities of daily living. So that's a term that occupational therapists um, know and, and use. And so um, those are just uh, all of the things that we do every day. Basic activities are things like dressing and washing and um, instrumental activities of daily living are more of what are called higher level uh, activities having to do with uh, things like doing your finances, for instance, okay? So all of these difficulties can create difficulties for carrying out all of those activities of daily living, often leads to need for caregiver assistance. Um, and then we have uh, communication breakdowns because of some of the difficulties that I just described to you. And this leads to a lot of uh, stress. We know from the literature as well that communication difficulties are uh, one of the major factors that leads to uh, early placement in long-term care when the family just uh, has you know, too much stress and difficulty coping with uh, the, the problems in communication. And so then people end up in long-term care, whether it's uh, too early or even if it's not too early, and there they're going to be cared for, not just by their family, obviously, but uh, by professional caregivers. And we also know uh, from the literature that um, in general, um, and I would say probably less so now, but in general, uh, formal caregivers often have little uh, lang the knowledge about the language changes that are associated with Alzheimer's disease or about uh, current recommended strategies. Okay, well that brought us to another problem <laughs> when, uh, when Roseanne was interested in, in developing her research. And what we found, um, and, and this, is, this, is, uh, this is why students are wonderful, um, what we found, not just Roseanne, but other students, because I uh, teach a course on, on communication and dementia, and I would teach about, this is a few years ago now, I would teach about um, what the literature, the experimental literature, the, the studies show about communication and comprehension in Alzheimer's disease. And one day some of my students came to me and said, because they're clinical students, so they're, they're learning to be um, practicing professionals, they want, they're going to be clinicians, they said, you know, we've, we've, been, we've been looking at information and we've been searching websites and some of the recommendations on, in, on these websites kind of contradict what you're teaching us in class. So that was really interesting and we spent some time then, uh, made those things into assignments and um, we spent some time looking at what the, what the clinical recommendations seem to be and we tried to map that against what the findings from, you know, in a controlled laboratory situation, experiments seem to be telling us. And what we found, and I'll show you a few of those in a minute, was that um, many of the recommended uh, clinical strategies um, didn't really seem to be based on the empirical literature, but probably just on clinical impression, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It was just that um, it probably had just never been tested to see whether it really was true or correct that these things were um, the best way to communicate. Um, so uh, we also found when Roseanne did her, her literature searches that there was very uh, little systematic research investigating, as I just said, these, these recommendations. There was some research available, especially about family caregivers. Um, and how to best communicate when you're in conversation with your, with your loved one. But there was um, very little uh, it, um, information or research that we could find that was focused specifically on professional caregivers, um, certainly not in uh, long-term care settings. And so this became the focus of, of her interest. So I alluded to how there were these kind of mismatches between uh, what seemed to be out there in the in the empirical academic research and what was not clinically recommended. And these are a few examples. So for instance, it's often recommended that you slow down, that you speak slowly, that you slow down your rate of speech. And it's actually been found in the literature that that's not always effective. And, and again, it's always important, I think, to to go back to thinking about what are the underlying difficulties that the person is having. 
So a person with Alzheimer's disease, most of them, as we know, have a significant memory problem. Uh, but remember, just for a minute, that this is what, what I'm going to say, depends on the stage that they're in. So if you have a memory problem, and I take a really long time, I slow my speech down to, to, to talk to you. Actually, you might just forget what I was saying right a few minutes ago. So this might be the reason that slowed speech is not such a great thing. Now, of course, you know, we wouldn't say, so talk as fast as you can. Um, I'm not recommending that, but I'm recommending think about, you know, maybe if the person's in the early stage and they're pretty mild, um, in terms of their memory problem, it won't have such a huge effect your rate, your, your, if you change your rate of speech. Think about as the, 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 the memory problem progresses, whether or not actually it will or it will not help. Um, again, uh, usually we would see something like if you need to repeat because the person didn't understand, repeat exactly, so use verbatim repetition. Well, actually, the research shows that uh, whether you repeat verbatim or whether you paraphrase, uh, the effect is, 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 is equally effective. Um, you usually find that the recommendation is to use simple sentences. And um, what we found in the past is that, um, and this is actually how I first became interested in this area a long time ago, that it wasn't really the complex in terms of you know complicated grammar and syntax that um, made understanding difficulty for difficult for a person with Alzheimer's. It was what we call the number of propositions or the number of ideas. So again, if you think about probably that memory problem and holding a lot of things in mind, if you throw a whole lot of ideas into your sentence um, without a break, without a response from the person, you're expecting them to hold on to a whole lot of information. It's not necessarily the, the syntactic complexity of the sentence that is, is causing them difficulty. And indeed, research has shown that um, grammatically complex sentences, if they're not understood initially, uh, can be well understood with repetition. So again, I'm not saying go out and speak to a person with Alzheimer's in the most complicated syntax you can think of, but I'm saying, well, maybe you don't want to kind of dumb down your, your language so much and make it so simple. That might actually have a deleterious effect, right, which we can talk about later. Um, so you can see, yep, go ahead. Could you give me some more examples of the last one? Because that's really interesting. Uh, just like a, a practical example that you would use any type of person with, uh, let's say, mid stage Alzheimer's. Yeah, so um, like for instance, said, yeah. if you said, um, I'm just thinking of our, of our stimuli, you know, if you said, um, uh, the boy was kissed by the girl and then he went to the store and came back with um, milk, that's getting to be a, a lot of things to remember, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's putting a lot of ideas in one sentence, as opposed to something like, the boy was kissed by the girl, which actually um, is, is a complex sentence, mm -hmm. um, syntactically speaking, because the, the agent of the sentence, the one who is doing the action, he de you didn't hear about, um, by the sorry, the one who is doing the action, actually, you heard me talk about second, right? I yes. didn't say, so the one who's doing the action is the girl. So I didn't say the girl kisses the boy. I said the boy is kissed by the girl. Mm -hmm. So you have to hold on to, to, to compete yeah. who is doing yeah. what to whom there you've got to be able to kind of reanalyze that sentence. That's a syntactic operation, and we all do that. That's difficult for many patients, as compared to the girl kisses the boy, let's say, which is a lot easier. That in itself would not be difficult for the person with Alzheimer's disease, um, but as you add more information that doesn't add complexity to the sentence, that what I said didn't make it a more complex sentence, grammatically speaking, it just added more ideas that they had to. Does that help? Not really. Okay. But, but you know why? Because I wanted. Okay. No, I wanted a direct example of how, like, if, for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, it's time to wake up. It's time to get dressed, and um, it's time to get into the dining room. Right. Okay. Okay. But if you're going to add all kinds of things, oh, isn't it a nice day? 
um, kind of, you know what I mean? Yep. Look at the sky's blue. Yep. Yeah, so that's where they get complicated when you start adding well, all the descriptors. Well, okay, but it's time to wake up, it's time to get dressed, and it's time to get into the dining room. That's all fine. Yes. But don't, but maybe, um, maybe get a response or get, um, whether it's talking or whether okay. it's some acknowledgement, you know, that, okay, I got you, time to get up now. Before you get on to, it's time to get dressed. So if it's See okay. what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. We might get to something soon that okay. also uh, you can hook on to. It. We'll, you'll let me know. Okay, so we find that there are gaps in our knowledge. I think I've kind of pointed them out. Uh, difficulties w with the mapping of the clinical and the empirical findings. Um, also, uh, we, don't, we didn't actually know at the time that this uh, study was undertaken what caregivers were actually using and what might be successful or not with patients. And then also how they might, how these things might differ across the stages of disease. So uh, Roseanne's research was to systematically examine um, all of these questions um, that I just alluded to. And the other thing she wanted to do was to um, get the input of caregivers as well as to what they thought was, would be successful communication strategies. So to do that, she undertook three studies. We call them the hand washing study, the toothbrushing study, and the perception study. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about those. Um, so her first study, remember we, we were talking about activities of daily living, and this is research, so we have to be able to control some things and, and, and in order to figure out what the effect is. Um, so we had to choose an activity of daily living, and we figured out, figured well, people have to wash their hands a lot in life. Um, and that's something that when you get on to the moderate stages of the disease, maybe you need help with. Um, so the question was, what do caregivers use when they have to assist a resident with moderate to severe Alzheimer's to complete the task of hand washing? And which of these strategies might be related to task success? Um, what we did was we, um, we had hypotheses that we generated primarily from the empirical literature. So we said, we think that um, providing one idea or one question or direction at a time will, um, will help with the, with the successful completion of, an aid of hand washing. That the use of a close-ended question, so that's um, close-ended question is when you say, you can answer it with a yes or a no. Do you want to get out of bed? Um, and, whether, and that repetition would be beneficial uh, whether it was paraphrased or verbatim, uh, regardless. Um, we went into a long-term care setting in Toronto and um, we recruited 12 uh, formal professional caregivers and 12 residents with dementia who agreed to be in the study. Um, and they were observed in completing the task of hand washing. Each person was observed six times so that we, we had enough data. Everything was video recorded and then there was a very, um, a very detailed coding scheme that was developed to, uh, to analyze what the communication strategies were. I must say I focused here on the verbal communication strategies, but we also tracked some nonverbal communication strategies. We couldn't really have hypotheses about those because there was really nothing in the literature that we could, mm -hmm. that we could build on, and also we could only look at a small number. We might have wanted to look at things like, say, eye contact, um, but we didn't, in the videotaping, we blocked out people's faces because people were uncomfortable about that. So there was, understand, you know, uh, we have to respect that. And so we couldn't, um, we couldn't look at some things we might, have, we might have been interested in, but there was still lots there. So uh, what were the results? What we saw was that um, of, uh, overall, people used, um, this is the percentage of time that these strategies were used as a proportion of all strategies used. So this is pretty much, this is the ranking of, um, of we looked at more than these, I'm just showing you the main ones. Um, this, these were the, the most used uh, strategies. So the use of one idea or one proposition uh, at a time was uh, by and large used the most. Uh, paraphrased repetition was also used. Closed-ended, those closed-ended questions, yes or no, 
Use of the resident's name and encouraging comments was also used, which doesn't come from the empirical literature, um, and uh, also wasn't part of the clinical recommendations. Probably is now, but. Uh, so that was really interesting to see. That was, okay, what do people use uh, globally speaking? And then the question is, remember, how about is there a difference between when to, uh, completing a task successfully versus not completing it uh, successfully? And the, um, the uh, ranking for successful communication was pretty much the same, except that using a resident's name was used more often. It sort of switched places with paraphrase repetition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. In terms of the nonverbal strategies uh, that we tracked, we found that people often use a guided touch. So that's just, you know, if the hand's going not quite to the right place, just kind of helping it get to the soap or, or the faucet, but not actually doing it for the person. Um, demonstrating in actions, showing them how it should be done, handing something to the resident, or pointing to it. There's the soap. Um, so in general, what we found was that our, these hypotheses were uh, supported that we had about one idea using a question uh, that can be answered with a yes or a no using paraphrased repetition. They actually used paraphrased repetition more than ver uh, verbatim repetition in our study. Um, and uh, we found these, uh, the use of these two, as I mentioned earlier, encouraging comments and the resident's name that we hadn't uh, necessarily expected. And we found, we looked at a lot of different correlations and things, which I'm, I'm not pulling everything up here. Uh, but we found that there was a significant negative correlation between task success rate and the use of these two strategies. So um, the more you, you used a question for verification, is that what you wanted me to do? Um, did you understand what I'm saying? That kind of thing the less likely there was to be, uh, the task was to be successfully completed, um, as well as, interestingly, the use of guided touch. So those were negatively correlated. Um, our second study was, as I said, what we call the toothbrushing study. Um, we wanted to know whether or not um, these things, these strategies that we found were ones that were found across different activities of daily living, or, or would it be the case that it was just, you know, in different, in different activities you use different strategies? So replication is always something we want to we wanna find in science. Um, and then the other question was about disease severity, because in our first study, the one I just showed you, most of the patients were considered to be moderate. So we couldn't, we didn't, we couldn't separate out the, uh, with, and ask the question of, is there a difference between moderate and severe? In the toothbrushing study, um, we set out to, to look at uh, severity, differences in disease severity a little more uh, carefully. We, um, we had basically the same hypotheses, except this time we added um, the expectation that the use of encouraging comments and the resident's name would also be beneficial coming out of our first study. And because of what we found in our first study, we were also able to have some hypotheses now about uh, the benefits of some of those non-verbal strategies that, that I mentioned. Um, so we had 15 uh, caregivers and 13 residents, and to the extent that you can have half and half with 13, um, the group was uh, divided between moderate and severe patients in the moderate and severe stages. And um, a, a more complete coding scheme was also developed this time where we, um, based upon not just our findings, but the literature at this point, Roseanne developed um, uh, a coding scheme that, that looked at uh, communication strategies that were task focused and then other ones that she called social uh, communication strategies. And uh, uh, this is what she found. So the dark blue are the moderate and the lighter are the severe, the patients in the severe stages. And um, what she found was that, um, first of all, there's quite a lot of similarity across the, the moderate and the severe patients. You see that everybody uses one proposition a lot and everybody introduces the task a lot, but there is a difference, significant difference, um, 
in the use of one proposition. So when people are in the severe stages, that using just one idea at a time is used even more than when people, um, are individuals are in the, the uh, moderate stages. Uh, paraphrased repetition is also used even more uh, when people are in the severe rather than the moderate stages and using the resident's name is also used even more um, when people are in the severe stages. Um, so, that, so that was interesting. And then in terms of the nonverbal, so there's no stars here, which tells you there were no significant differences between the, the use of these nonverbal strategies uh, with the moderate versus the severe group. Um, and so you see a lot of similarity handing the object guided touch, um, a touch for comfort, um, attention, demonstrating the object, and pointing. So you can see that these three uh, were used were used the mo most in terms of the nonverbal uh, strategies. And in terms of the social um, communication strategies, we found that uh, caregivers used a closing remark a lot. Um, Interestingly, that was not significant, uh, even though it looks like it should have been. And um, they greeted the resident, and they responded to the resident. And this is the flip, even more when the person was in the moderate stages, which kind of makes sense because probably the person, the person with Alzheimer's disease was more communicative themselves or asking questions or that kind of thing. So the caregiver uh, was, was answering or responding. Um, so we found a lot of uh, we found a lot of commonality across the two studies, which I think is good because you don't want to have to every time you do something different change your strategy. You might have to tweak it a little bit. Um, we found that these were the strategies that were most frequently used, uh, as I've as I've been saying, and from the verbal uh, one direction at a time, yes no questions paraphrase, repetition, and encouraging comments, terms of the nonverbal, handing the object, pointing, and using guided touch. And we found some novel findings that, that, that hadn't been in the literature, such as introducing the task, the use of verifying questions, the responding to uh, a resident's comment, and, and providing closing remarks. Um, in terms of, we've talked about this, in terms of the differences between the severe and the moderate, um, we found quite a few where people used more uh, of the strategies when, when patients were in the severe stages, um, when patients were in the moderate stage, uh, there was that responding to the resident's comment. Um, and now we have the question of the percept, what we call the caregiver perception study. And this, for this we did uh, uh, two focus groups with, there were actually in the second study two different um, in, um, institutions that we went into to do the toothbrushing study, so we did a focus group, one in each of those studies. We had a, a professional facilitator to help us with this, just a one hour focus group. We had a bit of a question guide that the facilitator asked people, some general open-ended questions just to generate discussion. And then after that discussion kind of wound down, we had a list of where we asked people based upon the findings of the hand washing study to rate the effectiveness, the caregivers to rate the effectiveness of nine of the task focus uh, strategies. Um, so when people were asked the question in that kind of general open conversation, which verbal and nonverbal communication strategies do you think are useful or effective when assisting individuals with Alzheimer's disease during daily care? Um, these are the, uh, the main ideas that were generated by the, uh, the, uh, the caregivers in that. So they said it's really important to use negotiation, um, to explain your actions to the resident, to use the resident's name, to greet, to use more than one strategy at once, uh, to show, to demonstrate an action, and to hand things to the resident when necessary. Um, when we ask the question, what are the highest rank strategies for both moderate and severe, they said again, use encouraging comment, use a name, give one instruction, and use um, guided task, uh, touch. 
Interestingly, if you remember what I showed you, um, caregivers used close, these close-ended questions a lot, but um, they, rated, they rated these as a not so very useful. Um, and uh, they also rank, they also rated paraphrase repetition as not very useful, even though they used it in, in our observational study, which can tell us something else, and which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Um, so then when they were asked the second question, do you think there are some strategies that might be better suited for individuals with moderate Alzheimer's disease? Um, they, they, they told us this, uh, yes, there are some, and, and some of these things, we've seen these before, some of these with severe, uh, they said postpone the task, just put it off, which is a good point, um, and using the resident's name, and sometimes you just have to provide full assistance. So that came out of um, their, their discussions. They also ranked some differences um, for us between moderate versus severe uh, Alzheimer's disease. So to conclude from all of this, um, I want to get on to uh, some, other, uh, some other work. Um, what we saw was that across disease severity and across the activities of daily living in the two studies, we saw commonalities of, um, of what was used, uh, which, is, which is these up here. Um, we also found these other strategies that uh, that part that caregivers use the encouraging comments and the use of a name and the most frequently used nonverbal were pointing and using guided touch and handing the object um, there were some strategies that were more often used with severe Alzheimer's disease we've talked about them and um, overall what caregivers told us um, was uh, um, mapped on to what we observed, right? Except for um, some of these strategies, like, for instance, greeting the resident. They didn't actually greet the residents, um, even though they said that's important. Um, we didn't observe them to be using negotiation, even though they said that's important. Um, they and they used these things, even though um, they didn't necessarily uh, say that. They were important. So this leads me into the next little bit I want to talk about um, and my reminder there is that this has come up again with family caregivers in a very recent study by our colleagues um, at Western um, and that is that there can be a mismatch between what we and, and, and that's not just caregivers, that's what we all say and do in life, right? There can be a mismatch between what we think we do or what we think we say and what we actually, uh, what we actually say and do. And that maybe points to the need for, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna just jump this because I've already said this, um, for uh, things like um, uh, educational uh, interventions or programs to uh, help caregivers learn what the most uh, effective strategies are. And this leads us to the question of, are there any of those? Have they been done? Do they work? Um, there are, and they're, um, they're, this is what I'm showing you here, is the, a systematic review that was done by Dr. Kathy Magilton who's, and, and colleagues, uh, who's in the Faculty of Nursing at, at, here at the U of T. And, uh, and that Toronto Rehab, and who's very involved in working with nurses um, and, uh, and uh, helping nurses uh, and, all, and all healthcare professionals communicate better uh, with patients with Alzheimer's disease, also with stroke, but we're not talking about that today. Um, so in the RCT that, that we did, there in the end were six studies included, and, and the, the point it wasn't an RCT, <laughs> it was a systematic review. Um, the point was to look at the literature and see what, uh, what the effect was of interventions for healthcare workers who were providing care in residential care settings. And what were the outcomes of those studies? What were the studies and what were the outcomes? And to summarize quickly, um, what was found in that the result of all of the studies that were analyzed in that review were that um, with interventions, 
what we find is that there are often changes in behavior and in the skills and the knowledge set of healthcare workers. And there are often improvements in responsiveness and decrease in agitation and anger in residents. Not very many studies, if any, looked at measures of communication specifically. Um, and so um, this review and others suggested that for, to optimize um, improving communication between caregivers and patients, particular aspects of an intervention study would be important, such as not just providing new knowledge, but providing an opportunity to practice those newly learned skills, the sort of back and forth that you know we could have probably for the rest of the afternoon of what if I try saying this when this happens? How about if I had done it the other way? So to actually be able to practice that um, and have some time for feedback and reflection. And, and this is the work that uh, Dr. Magilton and her colleagues and students are currently undertaking. Um, uh, I just wanted to mention that um, since then, there's been uh, a, a very, there have been other interventions and there have been quite a few. Um, I'm, I'm pointing this one out because it was recent and very well uh, structured as a study and uh, this was a study where there was a very um, systematic approach to uh, teaching caregivers about memory and communication with patients with Alzheimer's disease and even so it was difficult to find changes in improvement in the actual communication of the patients the patients themselves, um, after the intervention, were found to talk more about their feelings about being depressed. Um, uh, but, and there was an increase in uh, caregivers' knowledge. There's also been something uh, pioneered, really, I think, by Dr. Pia Contos, along with her colleague, Dr. Gary Nagley, here in Toronto as well, which, is, which I think holds a lot of promise. Uh, for educational um, uh, interventions for communication and, and other things. Um, and that's research-based theater. So they take um, the findings of research such and, and, and make a play about it, which is then a, a real play, a professional play, um, uh, which is then viewed by all of us who might be interested. And you know what we learn from that is, uh, is something that can perhaps uh, be helpful in terms of our, our, our knowledge and our understanding. Um, we also uh, carried out a systematic review. Uh, uh, Egan and um, Carol Leonard, they're both in Ottawa and I and our students, uh, looking specifically at the effectiveness of communication interventions, so the kinds of things that speech-language pathologists might do and when you look uh, at experimental studies or carefully controlled studies, it turns out there aren't that many. Um, and so what, what the, the result of that study was that the highest level of support, which was still what they call a level B, not a level A, um, was for the use of, of memory aids combined with training of the caregiver in the use of memory aids and in some structured activities, in this case, specifically this breakfast club. And I'll just say a couple of words about that. Um, so this is a memory aid. Some of you might be familiar with them. Uh, they take different forms. It can be a scrapbook. It can be a, an appointment type book, but it has information about the person. The reason um, the effectiveness of these is um, uh, combined with training, it really is a lot of work to put these things together in a, in a kind of organized way such that they represent a person's life and that they're meaningful to the person and can be used in conversation. Uh, but, they, but they are useful for conversation. Um, and they might take different forms in different stages of the disease. So overall, the evidence from these systematic reviews um, is that there does seem to be evidence for the use of memory books with training, um, for the use of structured activities, so that breakfast club I mentioned um, 
is, I can't go into the details of it, but there are others, and some of you might be familiar with them, Montessori activities is another mm -hmm. example, um, but they're pretty structured, so that, so that when you, you go through the activity, there's a, there's, there are steps all the way. If it's a group that is making breakfast together, everybody comes in, they greet each other, they have a task to do, there are opportunities for communicating about whatever is going on, making the juice, making the toast, and so on and so forth. Um, in terms of medication, just to talk quickly about a few other things, um, there have been a lot of studies now of, of medication um, and whether it, it reduces the, um, the impact of uh, many of the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, there haven't been that many that have looked specifically um, on communication as an outcome. And so uh, denepazil, which is a cholinesterase inhibitor, has actually been shown to, um, to lead to diminished repetition, which for those of you who live with or work with Alzheimer's disease, you'll know can be pretty significant um, because people with their short-term memory problem might find themselves might be repeating the same thing, asking the same questions. What are we going to do today? Am I going to the dentist today? And so on and so on, which is really hard on caregivers. And denepazil has been found to actually uh, diminish. So that's not improving communication in a way because it's diminishing mm -hmm. something. But uh, you know, you might be able to argue that the diminishing of that behavior might actually allow allow other allow other um, uh, communicative and other positive behaviors. Um, and then uh, in, this, in this recent study uh, with memantine, what they found was that functional communication, so that's, um, again, your day-to-day -day communication, not, not, uh, not performance on a standardized test, uh, was actually improved with memantine, but uh, it has to be said that, that was what they call a secondary outcome measure. Their primary outcome measures, which had to do with performance on uh, different different tests and different aspects of language, didn't actually show any benefit for for men and teen. Um, so these things are always a little bit complicated. Um, another big area right now uh, that I think we'll see a lot of um, a lot of growth in in the next little while is technology and computers. Um, and whether or not they can assist in, in communication with uh, Alzheimer's patients. And indeed, uh, people are looking at the use of tablet computers and what iPads and so on and what kinds of activities might be useful. This was a, a nice uh, study where um, patients and families were, were trained and were given iPads and they had different Diff three different kinds of, of, uh, of programs that they could use, apps rather, that they could use. It was either art or music based, this simple interactive games like matching pictures, not really super complicated interactive games, or um, apps that were designed for relaxation. And the findings I thought were interesting, which was that approximately 50% of the patients were able to use and engage with the tablets. And both the patients and the caregivers uh, reported that their preference was for the simple interactive games with these, uh, with these. And so there have been other, and there will continue to be, and I think, as I said, we'll see more uh, communication boards, whether they're low tech or high tech, have been used. There's a program or a, an approach called Talking Mats, which is, again, a pictures on a board and you move them around and they've been found when patients and a, a family caregiver, I think it was a family caregiver, use them together, um, then that helps their, their help to uh, come to decisions about things they, they have to make decisions about. There's a computer-aided telephone system that's been found to help patients. Um, and there's this program uh, out of Scotland called Circa, which is again, um, it's, a, it's on a computer, but it's designed to stimulate conversation about your home and your your city and your place of work so I think there will be lots more singing is also um, is also uh, music therapy generally is also something that is um, taking uh, a leap forward um, these are all studies with small numbers of patients but provide us with 
uh, possibly good ideas and opportunities for future research. They, um, singing has been found to improve mood and social behavior. Um, this, this was interesting one here, that when the caregiver, this was in an institution, the caregiver sings in, in doing transfers, you know, from bed to sitting and so on, that actually um, this helps to, under, to help the patient um, comprehend better. Also group singing, so everybody singing, patients and so on singing in a group have been found to, even in the presence of, um, of declining abilities, you know, we talked about moving through those stages, even as you're declining, the group singing has been uh, found to have, you know, high enjoyment, engagement, at attendance, uh, residents want to come and like to come to those and um, in one study where caregivers quality of life was measured it remained uh, stable um, and so I think uh, these these approaches all have a lot of a lot of promise uh, dance has also been proposed as something um, either com either alone or combined with song and music as something that will Obviously, it's a it's a kind of nonverbal expression um, and communication, and whether or not it actually um, supports expression of feelings um, verbally is also something of interest to explore. And there are also storytelling uh, interventions that have that have facilitated social interaction. Just a few words about severe Alzheimer's disease, because of course, um, in institutionalized settings. That's going to be um, a certain proportion of the um, of the client population for sure. Um, this study by Estelle and Ellis is one where they did a very detailed um, case study analysis of uh, a, a patient in the severe stages, and they showed that um, imitation that the person was able to engage for a relatively long period of time and that this appeared to be beneficial imitation of both verbal and non-verbal behavior was, um, was present and making eye contact also uh, was still present and, and beneficial. Storytelling can also be um, used when people are still have some communication available to them. Caregiver singing, as I mentioned, with uh, severe patients is also beneficial background music and uh, tactile stimulation. So just to wrap up, um, just a few do's and don'ts. Introduce yourself, use the person's name. Think about introducing your topic, don't just jump into it. Offer one idea at a time. Probably use some gestures and use yes, no, and simple choice uh, questions. Uh, I found that interesting. Caregivers didn't use those simple choice questions and they're in our study and they're one step up from yes and no. So do you want chicken today versus would you like chicken or beef? Uh, still, it, it seems would, you know, gives the person with Alzheimer's disease a little bit more um, engagement when they can choose chicken or beef and, and they are able to do that versus do you want chicken? It's either yes or no. So you might, so it seems to me there's a progression from do you want chicken, do you want chicken or beef to what would you like today, right? And so how you're going to talk to a person and ask them those questions you've always got to keep in mind will be you'll have to think about uh, what their capabilities are in terms of the stage of the disease. Don't wait for the person. Uh, don't wait for the person to speak. Now we're on to the don'ts. So remember, it's it's often up to us at this point to initiate the conversation a little. Don't bother arguing. Remember, the caregiver said sometimes you have to postpone a task. Often you have to postpone a task. Uh, try to change the subject. Move on to something else. Don't ask those long, complex questions with too many ideas. Don't be persistent about questioning about recent events or asking them to recall names. There's really not much point and everybody will just get frustrated. Consider all of the above in the context of what's called personhood, um, which involves the ideas of communication, recognition, negotiation, collaboration, facilitation, validation, 
taking into account the life history, the values, and the preferences of the person. Um, and uh, I, I like this, uh, this recent article that came out of the nursing literature where they identified what nurses called being in communication and doing in communication. And those were two separate but kind of related things. So being in communication was, um, was uh, uh, viewing the person with Alzheimer's disease as being capable of being in a communicative interaction and context with you. Um, and then doing communication was um, the notion of taking into account the individual and what their, their capabilities and their, their pattern and their profile is and then modifying your, um, your interactions and your communication with that person to try to maximize it. Oh, I didn't want that in there. There. Thank you very much. I think I'm done. I don't actually know the audience here, so are you are you are you researchers, students, professional <laughs> caregivers, family caregivers? Like what, what anybody can volunteer what their interest is here. If you like. Come on if you like. Yeah, okay. I have a question about the staff that was being yes. um, observed. Were they mostly nursing staff? trained RNs or were they PSWs? PSWs primarily, yep. We had a mixture, mm -hmm. but you'd have maybe in a group of, uh, I, I, I could look it up, but you know, say roughly speaking, we'd have in a group of, you know, 12, there were maybe two RNs and 10 PSWs. There were criteria for inclusion in the study, so everybody had to, um, uh, you know, be comfortable speaking in English. Um, that was about it. <laughs> and uh, the uh, every all the caregivers were female. Um, they there was a range of experience, but many were. Uh, I'm trying to remember the average was about 15 years. So uh, pretty experienced caregivers. And um, we actually we actually I didn't talk about this. Uh, we actually were interested in the question of whether there was a difference in the type of strategies used and or whether pe the, the completion of the task was successful based upon caregiver experience. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were no significant findings there. So, so there were no differences. And, and as you were saying, English proficiency wasn't an issue? No. Uh -uh. I mean, people people didn't have to be native English speakers, they just had to be able to be working in English, which they were uh, already, so it wasn't an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Do you happen to know, through your research, how much, when it comes to training of PSWs, how much attention is placed on observing the patient first before any of these, these specific um, protocols are put in place? Right. And whether there's any specific training on how to observe patients? I, I don't know the answer. Somebody here, I don't know if anybody here does know the answer. We asked, one of the things we asked the caregivers was whether they had had training mm -hmm. in communicating with patients with Alzheimer's disease. Um, most of them, uh, it wasn't 100%, but it was a pretty high percentage reported that they had had some kind of in-service or continuing education type training. Um, not necessarily, I did, we didn't ask them specifically about their training programs. Um, and I don't know what the content of the in-services or the continuing education would have been. Um, do, do, do you know? Yeah, but then the question is really in your clinical training, I think, you know, do you, that's what you're asking, yeah, isn't it? I was it? just thinking, yeah. you know, an incoming class of PSWs, whether they have any, 
real advice or guidance on how to initially sort of like learning the techniques of communication are wonderful, but they need to be applied yes. to the right person and yes. part of or, or to the patient, the individual, and part of that would really be enhanced by learning what you should be observing about the client before I you. See what you're saying. Yeah. Right. So I just wonder if there right. is such a thing right. in 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 that kind of thing. In the uh, I don't know if anybody's here from the Alzheimer's Society, but in my background, uh, the PSWs um, got a specific number of hours with the Alzheimer's Society, um, and their you know their person would do some training with them. Um, and I know that the Hamilton Group had a project called SOS, and they would actually go into homes where they were having difficulty and actually specifically address issues. And they were really good at it. So they had a program, and they also had a lot of these things that they introduced. But go on the Alzheimer's yeah. website because it's quite they really yeah. do have a lot of resources yeah. for people. So, um, and I know that uh, just in my training, uh, I went out with one of the main they did the training with the PSWs. And I think that almost all of them now get some yeah. sort of training because they're so specific to them. Yeah. Taking care, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. the other thing research will show you too with the introduction of Alzheimer's into a long-term care home, it's usually with their first visit to the hospital. Uh -huh. Because then they see how stressed out the caregivers are and things yeah. like that. Yeah. But I just have three things. Um, distance, yep. did that make a difference when you were speaking with them? Tone, did that, and I know you didn't do this, but I'm always interested in research, palliative care, and gerontology, yes. like my background. Distance, uh, tone, and uniform. <laughs> Because I found when people walked in with a uniform, yes. things changed. Yeah. And I'll give you an example. We had, uh, I was in a Catholic um, facility, and the nun would come in on Tuesdays, oh, and she'd have full dress, right. and she'd do, and she'd have her rosary. And you know, before she walked in, it, was, it seemed like chaos. She would walk in, silent, and then she would start the rosary, and they all did the rosary with right. her. And I thought, this is amazing. So I'm wondering, really the recognition of uniform uh -huh. and how that affects communication because you see it instantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, somebody walks in in a white lab coat away. The difference is so I interesting. Don't think, I don't know that anybody's looked at that, but that's fascinating. It really, yeah. I was, I just thought, and then as soon as she left, you know, it started again. I thought, this yeah. is absolutely amazing. Wow. But I always notice tone. Yes, tone has been yeah. looked at, especially with severe, in the severe stages. So people yeah. remain sensitive to the tone of your voice, for sure. And I found with the, with yeah. the end, end of Alzheimer's, it mattered whether it was a male or female. I don't oh, know why okay. who approached them, but they seemed to, and it, it's almost as if um, they didn't recognize you, but they knew if they could trust you. Uh -huh. and you could go. But so we, in the yeah. sense, you're saying a male being more threatening, or a It depended if okay. it was a female who they were addressing, you know, some okay. of the men, or, and, and the relationship, oh. but they did change with male and female, oh. whoever came in, and how oh, lyrical gender, their voice was, oh. and how lyrical their voice was. Oh, we found that with autism, too, kids uh -huh. with autism, uh -huh. that if the voice was lyrical, uh -huh. it was like a calming down. Oh, okay. And so that makes sense when you so think about the singing. To watch. Yeah. The singing oh yeah, uh, but it's but, the, but so the lyrics and the, the softness. Uh -huh. And the softness. Yeah. So you know when you said saying about singing when yes. you were transferring makes yes. absolute sense. Mm -hmm. Like in the most extreme cases, we also found bird sounds, nature sounds oh. really helped. Oh, okay. Really helped with shallow. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. that was and it was really interesting to watch too, depending on huh. who we were dealing with. But yeah, so that was I just. Those kinds of things that you don't think about, but right. the singing was right. magical, right. and the uniform switch. Singing, singing of the. Um, I mean, I found it interesting that there. I mean, there are some findings that are about singing of everybody, the person with mm -hmm. Alzheimer's disease as well, or singing of the caregivers. Singing, right? Of the caregivers. So you're right. thinking singing of yeah. the caregivers uh, in the yeah. group. In the group, um, did see it as much, but uh -huh. absolutely. And I'll tell you that softer the voice. Uh -huh. They got the results. Matter of fact, it was almost like we they specialized and we say, okay, can we have so and so? Because we know. And they say, oh, and she'd sing a song, just beautiful. Irish is the accent. The Irish yes. accent is is magical. <laughs> <laughs> magical there you go. <laughs> Anyways, so oh, yeah. Oh, thank you. For that. <laughs> uh, anybody else? <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.